It is important just to note, as a historical fact, that people like the people in this room are now coming to a place where they think it is important to act in a different way, and are so doing. Now, I say that for because as a historian, and I worked in Paris, as a political economist and as a historian, it isn't always that people come to a place where they change something, brings them to a point of change personally. I think it's a big deal, historically, when that process begins to develop slowly beneath the surface. So I, people like us and friends of ours and many, many, many thousands of people have something's happened. And I think that's a terribly important moment in history when people begin to say, minimally, something is profoundly wrong. And secondarily, maybe I should do something different. Those are the prehistories, moments of prehistory, often, but not always, of moments of great change. University Circle in Cleveland, an area that's home to some of the city's most iconic institutions, the Cleveland Clinic, university hospitals, and a host of others. It's also home to struggling neighborhoods where unemployment is high and the median income for those working is just above $18,000 a year. So along comes an idea hatched by the Cleveland Foundation, the world's first community foundation. Why not find a way to connect the needs of the anchor-based institutions in the area with the needs of the people living in the neighborhoods surrounding them? Well, the Cleveland Foundation has launched a community wealth building initiative and economic inclusion initiative called the Evergreen Cooperatives. It's part of our uh, anchor-based strategy. And, and the real reason for, for creating this initiative is to create jobs and wealth and on the premise that an $8 an hour job in and of itself is not going to transform someone's lives. So a uh, core belief of ours is to create ways for residents of our communities to not just have jobs and uh, living wage jobs with health care benefits, but to have some ownership stake in the businesses. And we think that that is a core principle of sustainability. The Evergreen Cooperative Laundry is one of those businesses. It's a laundry service that cleans linens for local hospitals, nursing homes, and other companies. It's nearly two years old, and the people who work there have good jobs and the chance to become owners. I think it's important to note that um, it costs $6,000 to retrain a person for a $9 an hour job. That doesn't include the quality problems you have when, you, when they've already left you intellectually, then emotionally, and they're already gone there, and the work they're doing isn't up to your standards. And, and so what we have here is a significant smaller turnover rate, lower turnover rate, than the competitors up the street. The laundry's facilities are state-of-the-art and very green. Steam from wastewater is used to heat the fresh water that's used to wash the linens. Instead of using traditional steam irons, the laundry has more energy-efficient irons that are heated by internal chambers that contain hot oil. They have special washers, too, that use a fraction of the water that traditional washers use. But the most impressive feature of the business is that it's providing the workers here with lives they didn't think were possible. It's great motivation because it's, it's actually something that I'm doing to benefit me and my family. So that's how I look at it. It's, it's more than just a job to me. I take it very personal. If I see people that are not doing what they're supposed to do, I'm like, come on, you know, pick up the pace. You know, we got to get this stuff out. So it's very important and it's a very great opportunity. And like I said, I love working here. Yeah. Great group of people here. You know, we all work good together. Just, it's just a great place to be. It's been, like, I just couldn't believe it. It's like a dream come true. Like, when I first heard about it, like, you can be a worker owner. I said, hmm, you sure, you know, you sure about that? We work on her here. So yes, it's true, it's amazing. It's the best thing that can ever happen. The Cleveland Clinic is working with another cooperative, Evergreen Cooperative Solar. OCS installed these solar panels atop the clinic to help the hospital lower its energy costs and to reduce its carbon footprint. Evergreen Cooperatives are a very exciting part of the University Circle Initiative. We're really encouraged by the concept of building community wealth, not just jobs. So employee ownership is really attractive. And the strategy of 
approaching the anchors to talk about where we have gaps, where we might have opportunities in our supply chain, and then building businesses, employee ownership businesses around those needs helps us succeed in what we're doing. The cooperatives are just one part of the master plan to create sustainable communities called the Greater University Circle Initiative. It works like this. The Cleveland Foundation supplies and secures grant money that's combined with more than $2 billion of investments from the anchor institutions. Besides funding cooperative businesses, the money is also used to put in walkways and parks, build and refurbish schools, add playgrounds and recreation areas, go green wherever possible, connect to public transportation, and there's even money for employer-assisted living. And it's pretty amazing that this group of leaders have been so committed to the idea of working together and really seeing the win-win, the win-win for the institutions that they're going to be anchored here in these communities and they're not going to get up and go away and that collectively we need to figure out how to stabilize the neighborhoods around those institutions but how do we make it a win-win for the residents and the stakeholders that live there. It all adds up to neighborhoods that are more accessible, greener and more stable and the approach is gaining some national attention. I think it's fair to say that this is a new national model and, it, and we have people coming from all over the country to even though we're in the early stages and this is still a, a concept that is being proved out who are coming um, from communities <clears throat> all over even the world to see what we're doing here. Let me say a little bit more about one of the or two of the principles that focus our work uh, both in Cleveland and in general. We've been trying to study emergent political economic models that in one way or another democratize capital, democratize the ownership of capital. And we selected that particular focus for one of our focuses, or foci, was uh, because, you know, the numbers related to the distribution of income and wealth are extreme, but they also have political and democracy implications. The latest number I saw, and some of you, I looked at it ten times. The top 400 wealth owners have more wealth than the bottom half of the society put together. That number is accurate. It's been double checked around and I didn't believe it for a while. That's medieval. I don't mean that rhetorically. I mean the structure of medieval society was organized with a concentration of wealth that great. Possibly not even that great. So the question becomes can you have democracy as well as an ecologically stable system if you don't actually alter those distributional patterns in a democratic way. So part of what we're interested in, in in the many different models is that principle. And Cleveland illustrates the Evergreen Project, illustrates one way to do that. The, the second way to look at this is we've been watching the development and attempting to understand it as an evolution of different forms of reaching to this principle. So for over the last 30 years or 35 years, Employee-owned companies, ESOPs, and others have gone from a few hundred to about 11, 13,000, I think, 12.6 uh, million people involved. There are more people involved in worker-owned companies in the United States than there are members of unions in the private sector. What's interesting about that is the evolution over time. And in many instances, as time goes on, more democratization even though the ESOP form is the least democratized form, it is becoming more democratized over time. So the point about that is trajectory, trend, and evolution, again, of forms that might be valuable as part of, part of answering what do you want. Supposing you were able actually to say we want a systemic change, what do you want? And if you don't know what you want, why should we talk to you about it? That's nasty. That's a very nasty question. And it forces the question of democracy and change right onto everybody's plate. You want a sustainable, ecological, and dem democratic system? What does it look like? Cooperatives is a network of employee-owned businesses. We are looking at a new paradigm for creating wealth in the Cleveland community. 
we will create a network of for-profit businesses that will hire from the neighborhoods and the employees will own the businesses that are created. It can't be just another initiative. I think for all of us, we want this to have meaning and scale and to be transformative. And it's just that simple. As this is more than a job, this is an ownership opportunity. Having uh, people able to participate in the creation and access to wealth that would normally be excluded is, is the, really the best part of this. I envision being one of the owners to make the decisions about Evergreen and expanding. As these businesses grow, uh, that, that roots these, these uh, projects in the community long term. That's good for us because as we reestablish relationships and create new supply chains and new service relationships, uh, we don't have to go back and revisit them You know, as companies move in and out of the market and things like that. It can't do nothing but benefit the neighborhood. When you make money and you spend your money where you make it at, it gets to float around. And when it floats around, it, it benefits everybody that touches it. It isn't just a job, it is their future long term. And we think that can really help bring about some positive change in the neighborhood. I had some good people out there that believed in me and they gave me a second chance. And so I can plan for my future now. They are really willing to put the hard work necessary to make a difference in their own lives and the lives of their families. They're revitalizing their neighborhood and taking ownership of their future. We are investing through our purchase of services in the employees who uh, will end up owning the businesses. Over the next three to four years, we think we can create somewhere 500, 600 jobs in these uh, low-income neighborhoods of Greater University Circle. What we're doing is catalyzing something. We're catalyzing you know, a whole new grouping of companies. That's not construction, that's not salaries of their staff, uh, that is to purchase uh, food, and it's for things like laundry. We're market driven, but instead of being investor driven as well, we're, we're worker owner driven. And we determine uh, pretty accurately that there's 250 million pounds of healthcare bed linen available annually. With recent legislation, Ohio has a mandate to create 60 megs of solar generating capacity in the year 2012. And right now there's two. We're targeting several megawatts over the next couple of years and you know that's on the order of nothing that's been done in Ohio to date. It's going to be a great day to be knowing that we are helping to generate some power in a clean, environmentally responsible way. This is a laboratory for a new kind of economic development. It's actually a career which is one of the reasons that I wanted to be involved with it because it's not just a job. This is different. It is higher risk. It's not based upon the social service model but the business model and the co-op um, ownership model. It could serve as a, a model not just here but but other places in the same way it helped in, uh, in Spain, it, it, it could be that here too. It offers a bootstrap strategy for pulling yourself up with your own resources. It could be that here too. As this company expands, so do your wealth. The lesson that we found, learn how to run everything in here and also teach other people what, I, you know, what I've learned. You know, we're not asking for dollars to stop at one company or two companies. If we can keep going to 20 and 30 companies and get to the scale that they experienced in Mondragon, that's, I think, one definition of success. In five years, where this is going to go, I think uh, most cities is going to jump on or, or want to look at what we're doing here and, and use us as a model. Cleveland wants to be where the world is going, not where the world is. Just being a part of Evergreen in general is tremendous. And uh, I believe it's more of a part of uh, a green city on a blue lake. Or I, I thought I would have to move to Portland, Oregon to be part of the green revolution. Uh, being here 
in Cleveland, it's good. it looks like we're gonna spearhead what's going on. This really is just the beginning. It's a great model. You know, this is the real deal, and you can see the guys over here and the ladies that are gonna own this company, um, and what an incredible opportunity. My name is Michael McNary, and I am an employee of Ohio Solar Cooperative, and I'm also an owner. It is really a great day for Cleveland. It's a great day for the employee owners. It's really a great day for all of us working together. It is comprehensive and very thoughtfully planned. It is transformative in a way that enhances the quality of life for all of those who will be touched by it. It is innovative and unique, and it provides sustainable services to Cleveland's institutions. I just envision us being everywhere in Cleveland, like we'll have plenty of them. Like every time you turn around, you'll see Evergreen. this morning about the Evergreen Cooperative Initiative. So many funders were in the room, but we have a few who weren't able to be there. So can you talk a little bit about the exciting work that's going on in Cleveland now? Well, the Evergreen Cooperative Initiative has been going on for a couple of years in Cleveland, so it's still early, and we're still learning a lot. But the idea is to create jobs in very low-income, disinvested neighborhoods in Cleveland, organize the jobs so that people are not only getting a living wage and health benefits, but they have an ownership stake in their companies. We're organizing them as cooperatives so that over time people are building their wealth even though they may come from a household where their traditional median household income might be $18,000. One of the innovations that we're doing in Cleveland is linking these new businesses based in the community and hiring locally to the supply chain and the procurement of our big nonprofit institutions, what are called anchor institutions, hospitals, universities, cultural centers, museums, and so forth. These are the kind of institutions, they're called anchors for a reason. Unlike a lot of corporations which get up and leave companies and go to China and, and so forth, these companies, or these nonprofit organizations stay in our community. Um, the Cleveland Clinic, big hospital, one of the most prestigious in the world, it's based in Cleveland and it's never going anywhere. It's gonna be there in 100 years. So there are partners that we can count on and that's part of the model. I know that the Cleveland Foundation played a pivotal role in um, initiating this work. Can you talk some about their role and what you see as the role of philanthropy? Well, for a strategy like this, the, uh, philanthropy is absolutely critical because it provides the lowest cost capital of all. You know, if you go to a bank, if you can get a loan in inner city neighborhoods, which is very difficult, as you know, you're going to be paying a market rate of 7 or 8 percent at least. Uh, but uh, foundation money, whether it's grant, which is the best money of all, of course, or it's a program-related investment, maybe 2% you know, over a seven-year period, that's very low-cost capital. And our inner-city neighborhoods uh, and our distressed uh, communities are starved for capital. So getting access to capital is critical. So the Clinton Foundation, which is the second largest community foundation in the country, and the oldest, um, has uh, put $3 million of grant funding into what we call the Evergreen Fund. And we use that to then unlock other sources um, of HUD money from the government, commercial bank loans, and the like. But the other part that Cleveland Foundation played, and I think this is a very important role for philanthropy in the city, is uh, it was able to bring to the table the leadership of the big institutions in Cleveland. And, um, you know, while these are world-class institutions, like the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve University, it's the same kind of institutions here in the Washington regional area, um, uh, historically, they didn't play well together. Um, some of them were competitors. They didn't see their interests as similar. So the Cleveland Foundation, as a kind of honest broker, was able to bring the big institutions to the table to develop a strategy together. And so creating that space or that environment was an absolutely essential role for the foundation and for philanthropy everywhere. At the Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers, we talk a lot about going beyond dollars yeah. and the ability of philanthropy to um, leverage additional dollars, to promote partnerships, to give voice to a problem. It sounds like that's exactly what happened 
in Cleveland, they were able to bring many people to the table, they were able to get resources from, from other places, and they were really able to move this incredible initiative. I heard a quote from um, a, a program officer from the Cleveland Foundation talking about the empowerment zones and the, the monies that had been put into the community. Can you talk a little bit about how this, compa how this initiative compares to some of the other, um, or some of the federal initiatives that have brought dollars, workforce development, that kind of thing, right. into communities? Well, we've, you know, in the last 20, 30 years in the United States, we've had a, I'll use the word paradigm, I know it's a, a lot of people roll their eyes, but I think it's a useful word here. We've had a certain paradigm or structure of economic development and job creation in urban areas. Um, and we've uh, uh, tried a number of different tools. One is we've put lots of block grant money and empowerment zone money into cities. And a problem is, over and over again, we haven't seen it move the needle on poverty. You know, there's still as much poverty today after 30, 40 years of really extraordinary effort. And I'm not criticizing the effort, but I think all of us, and I include myself, who are in this work, we need to look at ourselves and say, how is it after all of this investment, all this federal investment, we have more poor people in America than we've ever had? Now, that's not to say, well, none of that works and we should throw it all away and only the private sector should be involved. I'm not making that argument. But we need to find new approaches. And India Pierce Lee, my colleague at the Cleveland Foundation, Director of Community Development, tells a story when she worked for a previous mayor. She was in charge of over $100 million of empowerment zone money, which went into neighborhoods. And at the end of the day, uh, there were no more jobs than before the $100 million. Nothing had really changed in the dynamic. And the Cleveland Foundation recognized this. And I think it's, um, you know, it's a very innovative foundation. And, and I'd say this is a risk-taking strategy. So this is not for the faint of heart. This is not for philanthropists who don't want to encounter any risk. Um, but the foundation said, look, if we're going to change the dynamic, we need new approaches. And one of the approaches they took was, well, how do, one of the questions they asked themselves is, how do we get money into low-income communities and ensure that it stays there, that it creates capital, that it's cre changing the economic dynamic within the community. And as a result, having asked that kind of question, we decided on a cooperative development strategy. It's not that cooperatives and worker ownership, everybody in Northeast Ohio talks about them, this is quite new, but they were willing to take that sort of um, chance. And so the, the worker owners, what will be their, um, their level after, of ownership? It's after a certain number of years, and they own at what level? Well, in a worker cooperative, uh, the way it works is you actually buy your job, you know, which uh, how many Americans understand that concept? Um, because you have a stake in the company, because it's your company. It's not owned by outside investors. So first you go through a six-month training program where you're not a member of the cooperative. Then if you pass all the performance reviews and so forth, you're voted into the company by the other workers. So your colleagues would say, yes, you're good enough. We want you in our company. It's our company. We think you're going to contribute. And then you buy your share in the company. Now, we set the share price at $3,000. Now, none of our people, literally, that we've hired from our low-income neighbors have $3,000 in the bank. So we give everybody a raise, and from that raise, we deduct 50 cents an hour. And so over three years, they've bought a $3,000 share in the company. That's their share. But immediately, from the first moment they start to get that payroll deduction, they're now members of the cooperative. It's not that they need to wait three years. And so if there are profits in this first year, those profits, there's a formula, they're distributed into accounts that are the property of each worker. And the goal is to have those accounts build over time. And our target is if you work in an evergreen company, that's the brand, uh, after eight years, you'll own at least $65,000 of equity in that company. That's your property. If you leave the company, the company will give you that cash and buy out. So then if you want to start your own small business, for instance, you've got a way to do that. I think this is just such an exciting undertaking. I am um, just delighted that there's so much interest in our region, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it. Well, thank you very much, thank and you. thank you for your interest. It's meant a lot to us.
Ohio Cooperative Solar is involved in two principal areas of business. One is uh, installing uh, large solar arrays on institutional buildings in Cleveland, and the other is to weatherize uh, houses in, in the city. My name is Casey Gilfeather. I'm the Operations Director at Ohio Cooperative Solar. Solar is, is really development of, of solar arrays that are placed on the rooftops of institutional buildings where we retain ownership of that, of that, of that equipment and actually sell power to the institution. The, we sell the power that it generates. The process for, the, for weatherization uh, to be completed is that they uh, insulate the exterior walls, wrap the hot water tank, put in an a energy efficient dryer vent, uh, and do some other weatherization things in the basement of the home, and then insulate the attic. And in doing so, what, our, what the goal is, is to reduce the energy consumption of that house by about a third. The origination of solar as a business uh, came about really at the suggestion of Christina Ayers, who is the sustainability officer at the Cleveland Clinic. And she was looking for a way to get solar panels on her buildings as part of their sustainability effort, but knew as a not-for-profit that they didn't have, they would not qualify for all of the economic incentives that are really required to make that capital expenditure. So she said, Look, if you guys could create a for-profit company that can take advantage of all of those tax credits, then I'll show you our rooftop. And that was the start of the partnership. My name is uh, Steve Keel, and I am uh, CEO of Ohio Cooperative Solar. Not only do we have to be a for-profit, but we also have to own these panels. So we're putting the capital into these installations. Uh, which is pretty substantial. It averages, before incentives, uh, about $500,000 per install. So we raise the capital, we get them installed, we own them, we take responsibility for all of the uh, maintenance, and then we just build the institutions for the electricity that it uh, generates. Uh, they get an offset from their utility company, and so everybody's happy. Um, our main thing is that we've created those installation jobs in the process, and we are working under this model with the institutions to prepare ourselves for that day when it becomes mainstream to have solar panels on the tops of commercial uh, buildings and also uh, residences. So, um, so this is good playground for our guys to get trained and certified. Um, we quickly realized, however, that uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, installing panels is not a year-round business. We've got probably seven or eight months of construction daylight that we can work with and then um, so we needed since we were committed to full-time employment we needed to create a second line of business and we did that with energy efficiency um, it was pure luck um, it wasn't brilliance that we put the two together uh, because now we are qualified for so many uh, grants and special programs that come out of the federal and state departments of energy that uh, wants to see buildings uh, be energy efficient be before you put renewable energy on it. So, um, so it turned out to be a good business plan. It turns out to be two good compatible side-by-side -side businesses. Uh, we have the same labor pool do both um, the solar panel installation and the weatherization. So, um, so it's working out really well. I and mean, currently we're at uh, 20 people and growing. Um, so. We hope by the end of this calendar year, uh, we'll be at 25, and uh, our ability to sustain that level of employment is really going to depend on um, you know, continuing to get a good uh, set of uh, workflow from, uh, from both businesses. Uh, uh, it's easy to contract with the institutions uh, when our proposition, our value proposition is that you know, we'll go install the panels on your building, you don't have to put any capital into it, we'll take responsibility for all the maintenance and, and cost of ownership. And um, so we've got three years of rooftop uh, that have already been laid out for us, so uh, we, should, uh, we should have a good run uh, in 2010, 2011, 2012 to prepare us for the future years where we turn commercial. We're about to break ground on a, a large, we think it will be the largest urban food production greenhouse in America, five acres under glass, that's 220,000 square feet, one giant building, on a 10 acre site where we've just assembled the final parcel of land. Um, 
And it's not a boutique operation. It's designed as an employment opportunity that will create 45 to 50 jobs and will grow uh, food. It's going to grow about 5 million heads of lettuce and hydroponics a year and about 300,000 pounds of basil. And one question you might ask, is this going to put local lettuce growers in Northeast Ohio out of business? The answer is no, because there ain't no local lettuce growers. <laughs> so, the great state of California, from where I grew up uh, in, in Arizona, supply virtually all the lettuce for Northeast Ohio. So it's all trucked in 2,000 miles of carbon. And our proposition is we're going to grow this right downtown in the middle of the city and, and sell it to the local food market. Um, uh, and by the way, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about all this is, in some ways, this is a, the economists would call an import substitution strategy. Rather than bring stuff into your city from miles, hundreds, thousands of miles away, build it up from, from within to keep the money going, to keep circulating the money. In Northeast Ohio, we annually pay and consume about over seven billion dollars of food. This isn't just Cleveland, it's whole Northeast Ohio. Seven billion dollars of food of all kinds, of which about two to three hundred million dollars is grown in Northeast Ohio. So all the rest of the money leaves the area. So we're trying to grow as much as we can to capture it. Mary Donnell, I'm the project leader for Green City Growers LLC and Green City Growers Cooperative. I am in charge of the build out and design of a five acre greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Hydroponic growing is very, very efficient. It, it has high productivity. And um, it, we also, with climate change, with climate disruptions, um, we've um, a greenhouse grown crop can really pr provide year round, very constant supplies of produce where you don't have the dis disruptions that you have in field grown produce. In this last year, the Florida had um, very long periods of prolonged freezes and cold, and it disrupted the produce cycle throughout the United States. And I think with um, sort of dramatic weather events, a green greenhouse growing is going to become actually more and more um, valuable to produce buyers. We are using um, very pr advanced hydroponic growing methods. We'll use a float bed system to grow leafy greens. Um, it'll be a glass roofed greenhouse with shade curtains, illumination curtains. Um, so we're using, you know, sort of state-of-the-art growing techniques. We have a 1.5 megawatt wind turbine that we are going to associate with the greenhouse to provide electricity. We, we are looking at markets within a 150 mile radius of Cleveland, which is in a commercial scale operation kind of definition of local and hopefully we'll sell every head of lettuce and every leaf of herbs um, into uh, really the Cleveland area. We are going to provide a, a, or create about 35 to 40 full-time equivalent uh, positions and um, over time um, the employees will be worker owners so they will be it will be a cooperative worker owner cooperative business model which is exciting so that helps not only provide living wage jobs but also build assets over time for every employee. Profits um, will be uh, distributed to the worker owners into what's called patronage accounts that are retained in the business until um, the worker leaves or there's some kind of triggering event, retires. Um, but that, that money will accumulate and be allocated toward um, each individual workers. Then they then workers will also, worker owners will also be part of the board structure. So there, it, it truly is a cooperative, and, and uh, the workers will have a very strong vested interest in the success of the company. So we are forced to ask questions of this kind. And our particular way of answering it, of trying to answer it, is to struggle with these emergent models on the one hand, and with a certain series of principles and theories and developmental ideas that the academy, activists and others, historians, have begun developing uh, in different ways. So if you look closely at the, the work done in Cleveland, one of the issues is how do you begin to stabilize the local economy in order also to achieve a democratic possibility and a democratic culture? So let me say something about that. You can't have, I, I agree with Tocqueville and Ben Barber and many theorists, can you have democracy with a big D in a system called the United States? 
if you don't actually have people who in their own lives actually experience something called real democracy. Now, if that proposition is correct, and I think it's largely correct, that means you cannot have democracy until you rebuild the communities of, of the United States economically, politically, institutionally, and ecologically and making it sustainably. Very nasty. You, you see the test? The test is brutal, but that's the test we're forced to put before ourselves because if you can't answer that, what that means is the concentration of decision making ultimately is somebody else with the power and the finance. So the principle of working at a local community with that in mind and also building institutions that begin to involve democratic practice is not simply about a new, nice, a new structure that brings together worker and community ownership in a new pattern. It is about that. But it is about how you begin to broaden the base in any community so that the conditions of democratic participation and practice are sustainable and real. And they aren't in most American communities, which is one of the reasons the decision making is made by people who have other, uh, other values. It isn't simply who controls the parties, it's that the substructure, the whole culture, is not a democratic culture. The participation rates and the understanding of what it is to be a citizen in a community is not real. That's very abstract and it's very nasty <laughs> because it forces us up against real problems of how you actually produce a systemic change. The values in this group and our own values coming from where I'm coming have a lot to do with ecological sustainability which ultimately takes you to priorities, to no growth or reduced growth, and to processes in a system level which require major national decisions. Supposing you were actually able to design a system that would begin to reduce growth, the material throughput. Supposing, and the, the argument for doing that is becoming more powerful day by day for people in this room I don't need to tell. How would you do that in a way that was uh, democratic? There are big allocation decisions made, this industry or that industry, capital allocations. Those are systemic change involved in the growth pattern. But it also requires you to have a substructure if you want democracy. The Evergreen Cooperative Initiative that you see behind me is part of a broader economic development and community building strategy that's taking place in Cleveland, Ohio. So our intent is not to just build co-ops, not to just create a living wage or better jobs with decent benefits and uh, the profits uh, allocated to the workers that own the company. Ours is to revitalize and stabilize and transform a very large part of Cleveland, Ohio. So it's a place-based economic uh, development strategy that leverages some of the most powerful economic actors in our city that I'll describe and leverages them for the benefit of the people of the neighborhoods surrounding these institutions, which have historically been, um, uh, they've, they've not been able to participate in the economic growth in the city. So it's a comprehensive economic development strategy. Um, it also seeks to address a set of questions that are plaguing Cleveland uh, issues and challenges that are in the face of Cleveland, Ohio, but in many other cities. Certainly uh, being faced by Rust Belt or older industrial cities like Pittsburgh and Detroit and Cleveland and Buffalo and many others, but also are, are questions faced by high growth, uh, strong market uh, cities like many of yours may be. And so the questions that we're, we're trying to deal with and respond to through this initiative are the following six. First, how do we create good quality jobs in this country at a time of growing job dislocation and disinvestment in our urban areas? Second, how do we anchor capital, particularly in underserved, disinvested, low-income neighborhoods so that it doesn't get up and leave, as so many corporations have that have outsourced jobs out of the country? Third, where do we find financing for job creation at a time of ever more constrained resources for economic development? Fourth, how do we address, address the lack of economic opportunity that is endemic in many of our urban neighborhoods and rural areas, where unemployment is at double digit levels even in the best of times, and where as many as 30 to 50% of residents today may live below the poverty line? 
Fifth, how do we turn the vision and promise of green jobs in the green economy into real employment opportunities that are available to our workers today, not as some far off promise that people are being trained for, but they may not have jobs once the training is done. And finally, and most important of all, how do we rebuild the economies of our cities in order to stabilize and revitalize our disinvested neighborhoods? So those are the questions that have led us to develop the Evergreen Cooperative Initiative. What we're trying to do, as I said, is revive the economy of this city and rebuild it. Not just for Cleveland, but in a way that hopefully we can learn something for the rest of the country. So the Evergreen Initiative has three major goals. First, to create jobs, and I told you, very large un unemployment in the area we're looking at. Second, to generate wealth. And by that we mean, we don't think, when you're dealing with neighborhoods like where we're recruiting our workforce from, these are neighborhoods, as you'll see, that have a median household income below $18,500, 43,000 residents. We don't think a job, even a decent job, that's a 12-hour, 15-hour, 16-hour job, that that is going to provide enough resources in an asset-poor situation like this so their family can really get ahead. So we have to enable workers participating in Evergreen to build wealth. And the way we see doing that is through equity ownership in their company, through the worker cooperative form. And third, as I said, the long-term goal is to stabilize the neighborhoods. If we provide jobs for 500 people or 5,000 people, if it doesn't lead to the transformation of the neighborhoods into places of choice and where people really want to live and can flourish, then the, the experiment is not a success in our view. Um, for, let me just show you, in Cleveland, one of the things, while the companies have left in the main, one of the things that's left behind are a large number of what are called anchor institutions, big hospitals, uh, universities, art museums, the symphony, and the like. And they are really the economic engine of the city. Um, they, are, they are the largest employers in Northeast Ohio. Um, they purchase billions of dollars of goods and services, and these are some of the recent expansions of these big institutions. Those institutions are in that blue circle there. That's called University Circle. Surrounding that are six neighborhoods that you can see there, and that's roughly the footprint of our project, inside of which 43,000 people live, surrounding those institutions. Now, if you look at the neighborhoods, those six neighborhoods, this is a picture you see. And um, let me say, these, figure, these uh, maps you're going to see uh, are based on data from four or five years ago. So they don't take into account the recent foreclosure crisis and the recession. So all the little green dots, that is vacant property. Again, surrounding the core of the large anchor institution, that's vacant property. And by vacant, I don't mean parkland. I mean property on which there are houses, manufacturing, businesses, and so forth 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now it's vacant, some of it's owned privately, most of it's in the city's land bank. So there's a lot of uh, open space. All these little red, pink salmon dots show poor and unsound building conditions. Uh, places where houses are dilapidated and people don't have the resources to fix them up. All of these little black and blue and red dots, those really signal the coming foreclosure crisis. Water has been shut off, there are foreclosures, tax delinquency. Again, but look in the circle where the big institutions are. You see very little of that. So if you put that all together, this is the picture you get. That's what life is like for 43,000 people in Cleveland surrounding these institutions. One thing I should say, those institutions, just three of the big ones, two hospitals and Case Western Reserve University, annually purchase $3 billion of goods and services every year. And that doesn't include their personnel budgets. They employ about 50,000 people. It doesn't include their construction budgets. It says $3 billion, and virtually none of it makes it into the local neighborhoods. So thus our strategy. One, we work with the large institutions who historically have not, and frankly, been very connected to the community. And it's a story all over the country. Institutions don't talk the same language as residents. There's lots of suspicion. Institutions need property for parking lots. Residents feel their, their neighborhoods are being encroached upon. On, on the institution part, they feel like they're always being criticized, they can never do anything wrong. So there's a whole history that goes on there. And you know, I don't want to say who's right or who's wrong. There's a history. 
But what's started to happen is these kinds of institutions all over the country are beginning to realize that their fate, and indeed their business model, is inextricably bound up with the fate of their communities. Because if you think about it, if you're a doctor and you're being uh, recruited by one institution, and that institution's in a vibrant, healthy city and in safe neighborhoods and you can live near work, or you are recruited by another institution where the neighborhood looks unsafe, it's disinvested, you don't feel welcome, there are no grocery stores, of course this is a whole food desert situation we have. You know, you will tend, you might well tend to go for the hospital that has the better surrounding. Same with students. Parents don't want to take their kids to schools in urban areas if they think their kids are going to be unsafe. So part, as part of a proposition of what's best for your institution, our argument has been revitalizing and contributing to the local neighborhoods is going to make a difference to your institution, that it could really be a win-win situation. So we're working with the institutions to identify local purchasing opportunities that could be sourced locally of the $3 billion. Second, there are very few businesses in the neighborhoods that are capable of working with the Cleveland Clinic or University Hospitals. There are more mom and pop shops, car repair places, fast food places. So we had to get into business development as a strategy. And rather than just back entrepreneurs or try to induce corporations and big box stores to come in to bring jobs that usually aren't very good, aren't very high wages, not very good benefits, we decided to begin developing a network of businesses that we call Evergreen. And Medrick is, is a leader, a manager of one of those businesses, and we'll be showing you what they are. Third, we want to make everything as green as possible. And by that we mean each business, our proposition, as a business proposition to the institutions is this, that if you do business with Medrick's Evergreen Cooperative Laundry, it will be the greenest commercial scale laundry in the entire Northeast Ohio laundry sector. You can't do business with a greener laundry than Evergreen. So if your institution wants to shrink its carbon footprint, if it wants to take credit for being a better environmental steward, do business with Evergreen. And that's part of the design. Uh, fourth, we're trying to link this strategy to growing sectors of the economy. So in Northeast Ohio, you know, uh, automakers are not particularly growing these days, if you haven't noticed. But there are sectors that are growing, just as in your city. The health sector is a very large growing sector. The uh, retirement nursing homes, also very large. We have an aging population, people like myself. Uh, we have renewable energy is growing. The concern for locally grown food is growing. So these are sectors that we try to link our strategy to. And then fifth, we are trying to get to a scale that we'll describe to you. And that requires good, strong management, and it requires financing, access to low-cost capital. Uh, the businesses we're putting together are not particularly cheap, as you'll see. Um, I've worked in the nonprofit sector virtually all my life. Um, I've worked in international development, and I've worked here in the United States. And one thing I know is in the nonprofit sector, or in the kind of alternative sector, uh, we, we are capable of building some really interesting models, individual gems, I mean really beautifully designed models that never get to scale. They rarely get to a scale that can impact an entire community. And we're not interested in doing that. We are trying to move to a scale that can really create a tipping point in the life of Cleveland. So uh, this is what we've got going. You'll see up there in the right hand that very good looking man in the white shirt is sitting here today. <laughs> looking even sharper in a black shirt. Um, but that's uh, Keith Parkham and Medrick Addison are the two first employees and now the first two worker owners of Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. But we've launched, uh, we're in the process of launching three companies. Two are launched and out of the gate. One is uh, Evergreen Cooperative Laundry, the other Ohio Cooperative Solar. We're about to break ground on green city growers. I'll describe those uh, quickly to you. Um, our design criteria for what kind of business we develop is, as it says, we want them to be for profit. So we want them to be able to stand on their own, although we, we, we are fortunate to access philanthropic funding. So we can put in some early dollars that are the cheapest capital of all, uh, philanthropic money but they can't come back for more. They need to stand on their own and become for-profit uh, viable businesses. We hire locally, so we're not trying to hire from all over Cleveland. We're trying to hire from that footprint. 
and we're hoping that people will stay in that footprint once hired. A lot of the businesses match to the needs of the anchor institutions that have laundry needs or food needs, not all the business, but because those institutions are anchored, unlike the corporations, they're not going to get up and leave. Cleveland Clinic's going to be there in 100 years. So why not uh, attach our businesses to them and their success since they're the part of the economy that's growing? We pay living wage plus benefits, and in fact, we've made a determination. I don't know if this will change over time. I hope not. We've made a determination that uh, worker owners of Evergreen Co-ops get a free health care package. So they, there may be a $10 copay, but there's no, they don't have to buy into the health care package. It's part of the right of being a worker. They're green, the companies are green, and decidedly so, and it's part of the culture, and we want to get them greener over time. They're employee-owned, their, their current form is worker co-ops. We might include other forms of worker ownership, but we're, we're registering, incorporating all these as cooperatives under Ohio co-op law. And finally, as part of the bigger social mission, again, remember, of, of stabilizing and, and revitalizing the neighborhood, each company, that's part of the Evergreen Network, because it receives access to low-cost capital that's put together for them, and because it receives business planning and development and so forth, it makes a commitment that in perpetuity, 10% of the earnings of the company will go not into worker accounts as patronage, but will go back to a fund called the Evergreen Cooperative Development Fund that's been established. And that fund has a mission of seeding the development of new businesses, new cooperatives, again, in the area. So that part of the success of being an evergreen worker owner is not only having your company succeed, but having it run in a way that there are profits that can contribute to other people in the neighborhoods having the same opportunity. What we're endeavoring to do and what we hope we're doing, um, learning is how to put in place some of the building blocks for the economy that we would like to see develop in this country and the new direction for the system overall. We are potentially the people laying down the groundwork, both in ideas, practice, models, experience, theories, and elements of change, and in personal example of the history that might come. The truth is there's a huge amount of energy that is bubbling to the surface around this possibility. And we hope that we can help all of that energy succeed. What I hope we can do with the field guide um, is to showcase a series of projects, businesses, activities that demonstrate how capital can flow and needs to flow and, and demonstrates the principles of what this new economy might look like. This is really about bigger order questions like who controls decisions in our community and in our economy? Who controls decisions at the workplace? How are wealth and income distributed in this country? I think this is the most interesting time in world history and in American history bar none. I think we're coming up to the limits of the system. And the sense of people in this room that there's something that needs to be done is one thing. The sense of most Americans that something is profoundly wrong is also really critical. The <clears throat> challenge that I heard thrown out as a part of the conversation, though, is uh, trying to find new ways, new products, new methodologies for uh, supplying capital to initiatives like this that really are alternatives that the conventional financial financial industry doesn't know how to support. Well, you're sort of infusing entrepreneurship into a population that has largely been told it's not for them That's or right. they're not capable or whatever the messaging has been. And That's so right. there's a there's a, a multitude of things I think you're infusing into the model that make it um, more challenging, mm -hmm. but very worth it. Well, I, I think in Cleveland what we've seen is you can use philanthropic dollars and if you will, nonprofit dollars to unlock larger Absolutely. sources of capital. There's not enough money in all the foundation world, even if they liquidate everything and spend <laughs> everything out, to deal with the task. So we need to find a way to kind of marry the, the, 
the low cost or zero cost capital that foundations represent and partner it with for-profit capital and sort of buy down the cost to be able to bring together a, a kind of new strategy for economic development. And I think that's a lot of what Evergreen's about. I'm touching it every day so I know what the challenges are. I, I get wins every day. I get losses every day. So I get both sides every day. Um, and I can walk away at the, and come here and say, hey, wow, I get the vision, and let me tell you how it's playing out. So I do get the benefit of, of seeing just how powerful and impactful this, 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 this initiative can be. It gave me a second chance, I'll tell you that. I mean, I was looking at no job, no future, not a lot out there right now, and they came in, gave me a job, took care of me. They've actually given me a lot more responsibility than I ever had before. They believe in me. Uh, I'm moving up the ladder pretty good. It's actually been a great, great opportunity for me. They give them back to the community, giving people hope, giving people jobs so they can succeed in life. In a major way, like far as providing for myself, uh, being able to have uh, my own place, uh, transportation to be able to get back and forth to work, uh, being able to provide for my family, you know, so. Uh, before that, it was very far and few in between that I'd be able to do that. So it's, it's changed my life in, for the better. You know, as a younger man making bad choices, you know, going to prison, that sort of thing, and turning, you know, becoming, I look back on that person to who I am today. Total different in contrast, total different. Uh, you know, I was a more, I was a recluse, I was bitter. You know, now I'm more outgoing, I can speak to people. You know, I love telling them about Evergreen, what Evergreen's done for me, what I've done for Evergreen, and, and what we've done together, you know, so. I kind of made a conscious decision to change my life, but uh, it was hard getting the opportunity to prove myself. Uh, Evergreen has given me that opportunity. It's given people opportunity to be something. And I take that, I really appreciate that. If it wasn't for Evergreen and the Cooperative Op, I, I don't think, I don't know where I'd be right now. As far as any, you know, it's hard getting a job now anyway, and then um, having the opportunity to, you know, have a career, it's, it's just great, man. I mean, they changed, they changed my life in a lot of ways. It's great. <laughs> I get to own my house. <laughs> Stay in my house, pay my bills. <laughs> Before I came here, I was being managed. Now I'm a manager, so it makes a difference. Uh, actually, it's been a learning experience for me um, the whole time. Each day is something different, and I love the opportunity. It's putting actual wealth building material into the hands of people who would normally not have that opportunity. It's making them their own CEO. Kind of make, give me a little bit of sense of confidence, a little sense of pride, you know, to make me feel like I'm, I'm doing something positive with my life because I feel like a few years ago I wasn't being able to say that. A lot of people look at me with respect, you know. A lot of people look up to me now. I walk with my head high, it makes me proud. It has uh, enabled me to be a contributor not only to the community but to society as well. And. Um, it gives me a sense of confidence knowing that I can get up in the morning and come to work. And to me, that's freedom. In the last but one book I wrote, I, I mentioned that my great heroes are people in the civil rights movement in the 1930s and 40s. The people who laid down the groundwork for the history that came. So I think that's who we are. And I think we are potentially the people laying down the groundwork, both in ideas, practice, models, experience, theories, and elements of change, and in personal example of the history that might come. So I hadn't planned to talk about that, but that's, I think, a way to frame a, a much broader of the kind of concrete work we're going to be doing tomorrow and speaking about. So uh, by way of thinking about it, the second thing I want to say is, uh, I'm a realist. <laughs> I think these are very difficult times. And one of the options is that there will be no change. A second is that there will be disaster. But also it is possible that great change can come. 
So you get to choose without knowing the outcome of whether this is a period like the quiet for many years before the Egyptian explosion, or the quiet before the civil rights explosion, or the feminist explosion, or the first environmental explosion, or whether it's just decay or violence. And my bet is on um, there's nothing for us to lose by trying to improve the chances of moving in the right direction. And just possibly, revolutions are as common as grass in world history. And if you take a perspective of that kind, um, there is a finite, in my view, realistic and plausible chance that we will, in fact, uh, overcome and begin to lay groundwork for something different. So uh, that's kind of an informing kind of vision, I think, of where we, where we are at the Democracy Collaborative and Ted and I and our gang think about it that way. So the second thing to say about that is <clears throat> we are really interested in systemic change. To put it in a narrow sense, we're not interested in Cleveland. Of course we're interested in Cleveland, but we're interested in whether or not the kinds of developments in Cleveland and elsewhere offer beginning paradigms, not only for other communities, but also principles that might extend and be built to a larger systemic change as well. And we've got some ideas about that, and we've written some about that, but one way to think about it in a, in a general form is Many of the new uh, the, the ideas that became the basis of the New Deal, if not most, were first developed in the laboratories of the states and localities at that level and refined and developed in the principles adapted, which became the basis when the political moment occurred for larger structural change in the system itself. So that's always in the back of my mind, and I think Ted's and our gang at the, at the Democracy Collaborative, what are the possible extensions upward as well as <clears throat> across sideways in a horizontal sense? So we think of models in that way as well. And we were talking, John and I, before, there could be a major crash in this country and there could be a political uprising of a positive or a negative kind. And the content of what that would bring forward is not developed properly. People don't know what they would do if they had a moment to re reform the finance system, to reform, if you wanted to deal with growth in a serious way, in a no growth economy, how would you do it? So there is urgency about this time in really getting our ideas straight and organized. 